let's say you wanted to grow a certain specific kind of pear. One way you could do this is to use a graft. A graft is a, a portion, a shoot of the variety of pear that you like. You, you take a common wild pear tree and you hack into it. And into that wound which you've made in the tree, you place this shoot, this sprout, and then you bind them together. Now, at some point down the road, you're going to have the type of pear that you want, but this takes time. This takes effort. It's a process. There's some work involved. This change does not happen overnight. There is a, a life we are called to live by God uh, to produce a certain fruit that He desires in this life. Living this life requires that we make some changes. Some changes that involve cutting out who we used to be and grafting in who he wants us to be. These changes take time. They're a process. Today we're going to look at Paul's instructions about what we need to cut out, what we need to get rid of in our lives, what we need to prune away. We'll see just why they have to go. Turn with me, if you will, in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3. I'll be beginning in verse 5. These verses are also found in your bulletin. Paul had just told these Colossians to focus on the things above, on, on heavenly things. Not on earthly things, because we've been raised in Christ and our lives are in heaven with Him. To be able to do this, Paul is going to tell us we have to put to death some earthly things that were part of how we once lived. Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 5. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them... You also once walked when you were living in them. See, we got to change what drives us, what motivates us. God at the cross broke the power of sin over the believer's body. We are no longer slaves to sin, but we still have those impulses. The believer has the job of living this out, of cutting out, of putting aside, pruning off, these old impulses we used to have. He has to put to death these sin sinful impulses. That is, refuse to obey them, kill them, suppress them like you would weeds or vermin. The old us may have been driven by these impulses, but the new us needs to be driven by higher things. Paul had just told them, set your minds on the things above. Seek heavenly things. We cannot have our minds on heavenly things if we are driven by things of the gutter. Paul gives them a list. He says immorality, put to death immorality. Immorality in the Greek is the word pornania. It's the same word we get pornography from. It literally means any sexual act outside of marriage. Put it to death. He says, put to death impurity. This word means uncleanness in a moral sense. It's the impurity of self-indulgent living. It's doing whatever you think feels good. Put it to death. He says, put to death passion. This is a very specific word for passion. It doesn't mean all passion. This word means an overwhelming desire to do wickedness. He says, put to death evil desire. This is a, a wanting, a longing to engage in an activity which is morally wrong. And he says, put to death greed. This is literally the same word we use for covetousness. It's the desire for something that is not ours. He's got it, and I want it. He says, put these things to death because they amount to idolatry. In English, it kind of looks like he's saying greed amounts to idolatry. But in the Greek, it's really clear they're all in the same phrase. All of these amount to idolatry. You see, anything that dominates or controls our desires, anything that demands our attention, 
becomes an idol because it replaces God. And instead of being motivated to do the things of God, we become motivated to do these things. They drive us, they push us along, or pull us along. All of these things Paul just described are forms of selfishness. I want, I want, I want amounts to self-worship. And it opposes giving God his due, giving God his glory, doing his will. When we are motivated by our own selfishness, we can never think, seek the things of heaven. We'll always seek the things of this earth. See, we've got to change, and Paul tells us the reason. We've got to change or face wrath. He says, for when you see the word for in the Bible, you better worry about what it's there for. And in this case, it's the reason. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. The stuff he just listed, if you give in to those impulses, the wrath of God will come. This is the reason we should put the impulses to death. We don't want that wrath. The sons of disobedience are living by these impulses. And they will feel the wrath of God. So the question becomes, who are the sons of disobedience? We'd love to believe that that's strictly unbelievers. We'd love to think that it's just the folks that don't know Jesus. The question is, can Christians be a son or daughter of disobedience? Do we ever disobey God? Yes. See, Paul here is warning Christians. The folks he's writing to, he's called them brethren. He said they got a good love in the Spirit. He's never once questioned their belief in Jesus Christ. And he's telling them they must put them aside. For if you don't, you'll face the wrath of God. This warning only makes sense if they are in danger of being sons and daughters of disobedience. Now understand something important here. Paul is not talking about eternal wrath. God has more than one kind of wrath. This is not going to hell kind of wrath. This is physical wrath, temporal wrath on earth. He's talking about discipline from God on Christians who sin and do not repent. We must know that as Christians, we can face this wrath. Christ's death on the cross paid our eternal debt. We are safe from eternal wrath, but the consequences of our sins happen every day. And if we sin and keep at it and don't repent, God will correct us, discipline us. If we live a life driven by impulses, these evil impulses, Paul says we will be sons and daughters of disobedience. See, we got to change from who we were to who God wants us to be. He says a little bit about who they were right here. He says, and in them... That list, you also once walked when you were living in them. The Colossian Christians had once walked in the realm of these evil things. I got news for you, so did I. I didn't get saved until I was 42. I spent a lot of years walking in either these either impulses or some other either impulses. I guarantee I had covetousness. I want, you've got it, I want it. At some point I had every one of those. Some of them more than others. My life was driven by these sinful impulses. Paul tells them, now you've passed from that life. That's no longer who you were. See to it that you kill off these impulses. Romans 6.6 6 says, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. Did you notice it said might be done away with? Might means it's a maybe. When Christ died on the cross, it paid for our sins. We now have the option of putting these things to death. Before we were slaves, we had no capacity. Now we have the capacity to reject these impulses that we might put our body of sin to death. We must change from that old self who was a slave to sin to do that we have some work to do back to our pear tree. We have many things to do. We're not done yet. We just grafted in that thing. We don't just merely leave it alone at this point. After we graft it in, we've got stuff that has to happen. See, what begins to happen is the strength, the power, the sap 
The life of the tree comes up through the wild pear tree and it enters into this shoot and our new shoot will produce fruit. But below the level of the graft, the wild pear tree will still tend to throw out its own wild shoots and branches and want to produce its own fruit. So we have to lop off these wild branches. We have to prune them. We have to cut them back. That's what Paul is calling us to do. Cut back those impulses. Prune them. If we do this, a time will come when the tree will only produce this wonderful type of pear that we're striving to grow. We will have changed the tree from who it was to who we wanted it to be. This is what we have to do. We have to prune off these evil impulses that are part of who we once were and allow God to bring in new life so that we can be who he wants us to be. We're called to change our impulses, but that's not all we need to change. Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 8. But now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices. See, we got to not only change our impulses, we got to change our words. The first list Paul gave was all internal, our motivations, why we do things. This list is more social. It's actually talking about how we speak. These sins that he just listed destroy relationships. They're all connected to speech in some way or another. Since our new life is to be lived in unity with our brothers and sisters in Christ, these changes are necessary to the relationships we have to one another as members of the body of Christ. He gives a list. He says, anger. Anger is an abiding habitual hatred, and in it includes the idea of revenge. I'm going to get back at them. Wrath. Wrath is the boiling up, the sudden bursting forth of violent anger. He says to put aside all malice. Malice is ill will. It's a desire to injure. There's a wickedness and a depravity involved in this word. He says slander. This is speech that injures another person's good name. And he mentions the idea of putting aside abusive speech. This is kind of a general term that means foul, sneaking, low, and obscene speech. Anger, wrath, and malice are connected in the text to slander and abusive speech in a way that suggests that the anger, the wrath, and the malice were being expressed in words. They were having angry words with each other. They were having words of malice with each other and wrath. Somewhere along the line, we got the idea that words don't hurt anybody. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words may never hurt me. No, I'm sorry. Words do not merely convey information. They change relationships, sometimes permanently. Words can wound or words can heal. We've got to take care with our words. Paul says we've got to put aside certain kind of words. We don't talk that way anymore. We need to not be who we were, and we need to make sure we don't talk like we used to talk. This was a major struggle for me when I first became a Christian. I grew up as a skateboarder, and I don't know if you know this, but they don't talk very nice. There's some words they use. And it took me a while to get adjusted to this idea. We've not got to pay attention to how we're talking. We've got other things we've got to change. Paul says, do not lie to one another. The way this is worded is amazing because it means... Stop lying the lies you are continually doing. He's not saying don't lie to each other in the future. He's telling them stop those lies you're doing right now. The Colossian Christians had brought over lying into the new life. Lying makes us like the devil who is the father of lies. There's an interesting thing in this. It seems to speak to more than just verbal lying. The idea here is all falsehood, whether by actions or words or by inaction or by not saying something. Put aside all falsehood. Did you notice how this command is set apart from the others? We got these two lists and then there's a break and then this command is separate by itself. That means it's particularly important. That means it has a big impact and we've got to pay attention to it. 
Ephesians 4.25 says, Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth each one of you with his neighbor, for me, we are members of one body. Can you imagine standing in front of a mirror and lying to yourself? How does that go? It's not very effective, is it? Not very helpful. That's what we're doing when we lie to each other. We are members of one body. We are in Christ. He's telling them they should stop lying because they put off the old self with his evil practices. They are now in Christ Jesus. See, we're to change because we are different. We are not who we were. He says, since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices. They should stop lying because they put off the old man. They are not what they were and they can never be the same again. The things that were normal in that old life, they're now completely unnatural. This was a shock to me when I became a Christian. The stuff I thought was perfectly normal. Video images, music, words, actions. They're not normal for Christians. What I thought was the normal world is foul and obscene. It's a mess. We shouldn't be acting like that. We need to understand that growth in Christ consists of two parts. The putting off of the old man and the putting on of the new. The putting off of the old man is when we prune the wild shoots on our pear tree. The putting on of the new is the grafted in new life. Ephesians 4.22 That in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit. Frequently, the Bible uses this term lay aside. It actually is talking about taking off your clothes and putting them down when you change clothes. Take off that old self. Put it down. Put on a new self. The old man, who we were, is not converted. He cannot be. He is not renewed. He cannot be. He can only be replaced by the new man who God wants us to be. Back to our pear tree. At first, your tree will be mostly wild pear tree. As you prune off the old, the new will grow more and more. You will eventually have a pear tree which produces the type of fruit that you want. See, we're, we're putting new life in so that we'll have one tree that has two natures. The cultured and cultivated nature that we desire and the wild nature. And by pruning off the wild branches, we see the strength of the tree, the life, the sap, is only allowed to go into the grafted in branch, the new nature. The new nature will be strengthened and bear its fruit. It will gradually dominate the old nature, but the old nature is never removed entirely while only new fruit is produced. This is how we grow in Christ. We prune off the old nature. We yield to the Holy Spirit, which gives strength to the Christ-like nature that God is renewing in us. Colossians 3.11 And have put on the new self, who is being renewed to a true knowledge, according to the image of the one who created him. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, Circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and freeman, but Christ is all and in all. See, we're going to change, and the goal is to change to this newness. This newness is something that's being put on. The, the, the putting on of the new self is a process. The new replaces the old. We do this when we cooperate with, when we yield to the Holy Spirit and are renewed by Him. This renewing is something that is done to us. We must put off the old. Paul has called us to put aside, to put off, to get rid of, to put to death the old. We must allow God to put on the new. 2 Corinthians 4.16 Therefore we do not lose heart, but through our, though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. That's a passive verb. 
we are not active in the renewing of the new man. God is the one who does the renewing. Our job is to yield to the Holy Spirit. We are not said to do this renewing by our power. We are constantly renewed by God. And what we're aiming for, what we're growing towards, is to change to be Christ-like. Paul words it this way, to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. That image is the image of Christ. The goal is to make believers Christ-like. The new self was created to be like Jesus. Christians are to become increasingly like Jesus as they are refreshed in their new nature. Our part in this is to yield to the Holy Spirit, to listen to his call, to allow him to be our motivation. We have these horrible motivations, immorality and greed and all of those horrible motivations. Our motivation now is to be found in Christ through the Holy Spirit and not in things of this earth, but heavenly things. And this change that we're to make is never to be based on anything about us. Paul says there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and freeman. This is a list of the human distinctions in their culture. This is their diversity. And he says, you know what? None of that matters with regard to growth in Christ. All human distinctions are removed by the gospel. The ancient world was divided by all these distinctions. Our world is divided by all these distinctions. Christ has obliterated every one of these distinctions. Christ replaced these distinctions with one distinction. In Christ, not in Christ. That is the only distinction we have in this world. Christ is all and is in all. When we are in Christ, we are abiding in Him, walking with Him, yielding to Him, and we grow regardless of anything about us. Our growth is not limited by our heritage, our social status, our wealth, our gender. None of these things can keep us from growing as long as we are in Christ. In the midst of an orchard, there was one pear tree that was poor and sickly looking. This weak tree stood out all the more in contrast to the rest of the orchard of strong and flourishing trees. Year after year, the tree was sick, and the fellow that owned the orchard had had it. He was through with this tree. He was just going to dig it up. And he went to digging around it. And he got down about a foot, and he found a board. And he kept digging, and the board was round. And he pried up the board, and there was an abandoned well under it. And the roots of the sickly pear tree were hanging down into the air. Perhaps some Christians are like this. They're not rooted in Christ. They're not getting any nourishment from the word of God. They are saved and they are headed to heaven, but they are bearing no fruit. They are not growing or maturing. Only when we are in Christ, abiding in Him, walking with Him, only then can we grow to be more like Him when we yield to Him. But you've got to be walking with Him to yield. We're called to change throughout the whole New Testament. We're not supposed to just get saved and wait till we go to heaven. We've got work to do. We must put to death the old impulses that used to drive our behavior. This requires work on our part, daily work. And if we fail to do this, God will discipline us, will correct us. We need to change not just what motivates us, not just what drives us, but also how we speak. And these changes have got to include not lying to each other in words or in actions. We need to make these changes because we are not who we once were. We have put off the old self. And we allow God to put on the new self by renewing us daily. These changes are a process that takes time. The rest of our lives. We will never be done in pruning off the old impulses and yielding to the new life. 
These changes are not based on anything about us, not our race, our gender, our age, our nationality, not our social status, our rank, our wealth. They are based on our position in Christ. If there is anyone here who is not in Christ, anyone here who has not trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior, in a moment I'm going to pray a prayer and we're going to sing a song. And during that song, I would invite you to come forward and place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Additionally, if there's anybody here in need of prayer, I would love for you to come down that I might pray for you at that time. And finally... If anybody, if anybody desires membership in this church, that would be the appropriate time to come forward for membership. Father God, you are awesome and mighty, wonderful, holy, righteous, sovereign. Father, we are so thankful for you sending Christ to die on the cross to pay for our sins. For freeing us from slavery to sin. Father God, give us the wisdom, patience, knowledge, courage to prune off the old self, to put off the old self, to put it to death, to put it aside, and to yield and allow you to renew us to new life. Every day. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.